Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have an excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. What a busy weekend we've got in horse racing. Opening day, Saratoga, Del Mar, and the Haskell at Monmouth Park. Yeah, we're going to focus on the Haskell today, Matt, but we, uh, we love this time of year. Opening day at Saratoga, Del Mar opening. We're going to talk a little bit about both of those tracks for sure, Matt, but I want to start with the Haskell. It's $1 million, nine furlongs at Monmouth Park. It's a Breeders' Cup Classic win and you're in at race, Matt. It also has all three horses who finished second in the respective series of the Triple Crown. You want to start with a full field analysis? Let's do that. Yeah, I, I don't know, Brian. I, I, I don't know if it's a fact for sure, but I would feel pretty comfortable saying that having the runner up in all three triple crown races has never happened in the uh, Haskell before. And, and that means we got some nice horses. Yeah, absolutely. We do, Matt. And, you, you know, 19, uh, 1987 will always be the Haskell for me where we had Ali Sheep of Bet Twice and Lost Code, but uh, having the three runners up in all tri three Triple Crown races, that's not that either. Let's get to the field. Number one, following C, Matt, trained by Todd Pletcher now, used, uh, pre previously trained by Bob Baffert. Uh, he's looked very impressive in winning his last two. It certainly has, Brian. Uh, all three races, the, his debut out in California was a troubled trip uh, uh, that, uh, he didn't win and was involved in a little bit of the bumping around, but uh, uh, after that, a, a big maiden win, and then moving to Todd Pletcher and a big allowance win, triple digit buyer speed figure, uh, tons of tons of potential here, but a, a lot of things that this horse is going to have to answer, namely one, Brian, going two turns for the first time and doing it uh, in a grade one against quality horses that we have just uh, mentioned. Yeah, this is, this, this is du jour going a mile and a quarter last week in the Belmont Derby all over again for me. He's never been farther than six and a half furlongs. And to try to do it in the hospital against this field seems like a daunting task to me. However, with all that speed breaking from the rail, you, uh, you can bet he's gonna be involved early We'll have to see how he can hold off the big boys uh, moving forward. He's a son of run happy, Matt, which I don't completely trust around two turns as well. Might end up being a better sprayer, but he's getting, uh, he's getting a test and he's getting a big test in the Haskell. And I was a little surprised to see him as low as three to one on the morning line. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. You know, anytime it's Todd Pletcher, uh, uh, that means a horse is going to get bet, but Brian, you've got you've got three uh, three year olds with fantastic form, excellent results um, in the Triple Crown already. Um, it just seems hard to imagine that uh, following C is going to be that short a price. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It'll get bet to a point. I'm not sure about three to one. Number two, Matt, is anti-gravity. Anti-gravity will not be three to one on the morning line. He's actually 30 to one on the morning line. Trained by Jerry Hollendorf, where this horse took his time to break his maiden, but he's won two in a row at Monmouth Park. Yeah, uh, Hollendorfer, Hall of Famer, past winner uh, of the Haskell. The uh, owners were a, were a little bit back and forth about uh, whether they were going to run in the Haskell or they were going to run in an easier stake uh, coming up uh, in, a, in a weekend or so. But, but finally, they decided to give it a shot and see if they admittedly could maybe get third if they were lucky or fourth place money. Um, yeah, had it taken 10 tries down in Kentucky and at Oaklawn Park to break, uh, break his maiden unsuccessfully. Uh, but not that he ran bad in some of those races. He, he, he had some good efforts, but seems to like uh, the Jersey Shore. And Brian, what's not to like about, uh, about the Jersey Shore? A nice, maiden, a nice maiden win at Monmouth, followed by an allowance going two turns. Um, David Cohen is going to come down and get the mount. Yeah, he, he's a long shot. He's a big long shot. And, and I think we could separate this field about into four favorites and three big long shots. And it's a relatively small field. Why not take a shot? 
We've seen crazy things happen in the hospital over the years, not so much lately, but anti-gravity, I think of the three long shots is the one I like best. He did run against some good horses in those maiden races where he was running second, third, and fourth, and kind of in the picture. But uh, yeah, he's won two in a row at Monmouth, uh, around two turns, so give him a shot in here. Number three is Mandaloon, Matt, uh, two to one on the morning line. He has a local win over the track in the Pegasus Stakes. Yeah, Brian, it seemed like the, uh, you know, uh, from the Brad Cox barn and they had essential quality uh, who was going to be prominent in the rest of the triple crown. So uh, it seemed like they made a decision after running second in the Derby that uh, they were going to stay away from essential quality, aim for the Haskell. They did that by prepping in the Pegasus at Monmouth Park in June, a race that uh, Mandaloon won, I think by a margin a little bit less than what they expected. Yeah, Weybird came back at him. It looked like Mandaloon uh, at the eighth pole, or at least the 16th pole, was going to win uh, rather handily. But uh, that nice uh, that nice speed horse, Weyburn, came back at him that race. So I'm not, I don't know how great that prep is. But on the other hand, a prep over the track is a positive. Uh, I, I think we are starting to get into a rider's race here. I already mentioned following C on the rail, pretty much you can expect him to show speed, but then you got Mandaloon and Hot Rod Charlie and, and at different times in their career, they've shown more or less speed. I think generally Hot Rod Charlie's shown a little bit more speed than Mandaloon, uh, but that wasn't true in the Kentucky Derby. And now you got Mandaloon in the three hole. You got the favorite Hot Rod Charlie in the four hole. So I think it, it could be a bit of a rider's race here in this seven horse field. Let's talk a little bit about Hot Rod Charlie, Matt. Uh, for my money, you know I'm a Hot Rod Charlie fan. I've been a Hot Rod Charlie fan all year. Uh, for my money though, his race in the Belmont Stakes is above, stands alone above anything else any horse in this field has produced. No question about it, Brian. And there was so much talk about uh, uh, his effort in the mile and a half Belmont out there setting the pace, setting the pace with impressive uh, fractions, um, giving essential quality uh, 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 a little bit of a scare down the stretch and, and hanging on gamely to, to finish second. The speed figures uh, after the race backed up the fact that this was a very quality performance by both Hot Rod Charlie and essential quality. Uh, earning the two of the top buyer speed figures for three-year-olds at any point in 2021. It is no, it is worth noting though in this race that the blinkers are going to come off of Hot Rod Charlie. Does that change anything? Is it going to make him less uh, uh, interested and in being out setting the pace? Um, we shall see. Yeah, and I, I think it, it makes sense because he showed so much speed in that mile and a half Belmont, maybe too much speed in that mile and a half Belmont. He ran a great race, but uh, if he had relaxed a little bit more early, who knows how, uh, how much uh, tighter that Belmont finish would have been with essential quality. I like Hot Rod Charlie. One of the reasons I like Hot Rod Charlie, Matt, we, if, if we're talking about the three big horses here, the three experienced graded stakes horses, the Louisiana Derby was the race where Hot Rod Charlie uh, really took it to both uh, Midnight Bourbon and Mandaloon. Mandaloon didn't run his race that day, but uh, that Louisiana Derby is a race to look back at. They were all in the Kentucky Derby. I think Mandaloon had the best trip of the three. Mandaloon, of course, was second. It still could be the Kentucky Derby winner. But uh, these, these three horses know each other pretty well. Hot Rod Charlie's the one I like the best. Uh, I'm not always big, Matt, on horses coming out of the mile and a half Belmont, shortening up to nine furlongs, whether it be the Haskell or the Jim Dandy or another race. So he's been working well out in California. Doug O'Neill's been saying good things. It'll be interesting to see. He's six to five on the morning line, Matt. The number five is Pickin Time, who is a two-time stakes winner, a stakes winner at Monmouth Park. He's 20 to one on the morning line. Yeah, and, and uh, if you go back to his two-year-old season, he had a stretch in there where uh, – he was looking very good. Uh, as you mentioned, he won the smoke lacken at Monmouth Park. Uh, oh, and so um, we know he likes the surface. And after that, he went to Aqueduct and won the Nashua, a grade three, um, which probably, uh, you know, gives him the best resume of those three long shots that we have been mentioning. But his races back as a three-year-old 
have just not been uh, up to that kind of level. No, they haven't. In fact, his last race last year wasn't uh, wasn't very good either when he was well, well beaten in the Remsen and then to start the year this year. And then after a layoff, he returned at Monmouth and didn't do much off those that recent form and the return race. Tough to uh, tough to jump on him, even with the back class. Number six is a horse we need to talk about a bunch from out. That's Midnight Bourbon. Midnight Bourbon, I was a little surprised, is nine to two. Uh, quite a bit higher on the morning line than following C, but Midnight Bourbon has been in graded stake after graded stake, and other than a bad trip in the Kentucky Derby, at least a very bad start in the Kentucky Derby, he's always in the money, Matt. He has been, Brian. Second in that Louisiana Derby that we've liked so much uh, uh, behind Hot Rod Charlie. Second in the Preakness. I don't know, the 9-2 to two odds. Uh, you know, somebody's got to be a little bit more up there. And with Hot Rod Charlie uh, uh, listed at six to five, um, it has been a long time since uh, Midnight Bourbon has won a race. We got to go all the way back to the Le Compte to get a victory. So maybe that's part of uh, the morning line makers odds in there. But um, uh, I saw Midnight Bourbon up at Saratoga. Uh, when I was up there last week um, and, and assistant trainer Scott Blasey said he likes it up there and he's been doing well. He's had some time off. He's going to be a relatively fresh horse. Um, can't discount him. No, you can't discount him. There, there are a lot of things to like, actually. Uh, good looking son of Tiz now, Matt. Was second in the Preakness last time, ran a very good race and Ran a better race than the horse who finished first in the Kentucky Derby, Medina Spirit, before Ron Bauer, of course, went by them. But Midnight Bourbon coming off that second in the Preakness got a little freshening, like you say. Uh, he's a horse I could see actually getting better with the breeding as the year goes on. Interesting jockey change. He gets Paco Lopez up, which I, I think of as an aggressive move and one that makes me think Midnight Bourbon is the one that's going to go after following C early. Probably another reason I don't like following seed too much in here, because I think Midnight Bourbon is going to go back to showing the speed that we've seen in a bunch of his races. So Midnight Bourbon, a very live candidate in the six hole. Number seven, Matt, is the probably the longest shot of all. 30 to one on the morning line. His name is Basso. And I really don't have too much to say about the Greg Sacco train Basso. Well, I was at Greg Sacco's barn earlier in the week, and, and Greg Sacco had a lot to say about Basso earlier. Um, feels like this is a very talented horse, and I guess he flashed that uh, when he was a debut winner last year as a two-year-old. But according to Sacco, after that, things just didn't go right for this horse. Uh, um, a lot of little problems that two-year-olds have uh, were were popping up and some difficult trips and off tracks and things like that, including uh, his comeback race this year. Um, yep, he's a long shot. Do I think he's going to beat any of these horses? Probably not, but but maybe uh, uh, he's one that could end up in fourth, third, maybe. I, I, I tend to doubt it because it would be such a big flipping of the script. All those things you said, yeah, I kind of believe that he is better than he looks on paper, but going from a sixth in an allowance race to really threatening this grade one Haskell field just seems too much for me. Matt, let's talk tickets. I have uh, I think everybody here knows who I like best. We don't know for sure who you like best. Let's talk our tickets for the Haskell. I'll let you go first. Well, Brian, you know, I, I, I've had a lot of trouble uh, uh, deciding who I thought was going to win the, the Haskell. And there's no question in my mind that uh, on his best, Hot Rod Charlie uh, is the top horse in this field. But you know, this is a case, Brian, where six to five on the morning line, I believe he's going to be every bit of those odds. And, and those are short odds on a horse um, that I just can't, uh, I just can't go with, um, like you said, uh, coming off that big effort in the Belmont stakes, he's been training hard, Brian, out in California, fast, longer, five furlongs, six furlongs. He's been training hard out there in California and, and that on top of that Belmont effort and the six to five odds, uh, 
just really puts me off a bit. Is he going to win? Probably, but I'm going to have to play against him. And uh, that, did, that didn't really help me uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, my top choice. Um, Mandaloon, sure. Um, but that Pegasus effort didn't, uh, didn't wow me. Midnight Bourbon. Um, so um, I decided I was going to take a shot with following C, hoping that his odds are going to be better than three to one in my heart. Probably I'm not going to bet very much on the Haskell because of my, my indecision. But um, if I do, I will do uh, exact the key box, putting following C with Mandaloon, Hot Rod Charlie, and Midnight Bourbon, hoping that following C finishes first or second. Okay, and I, I'm really not on following C in this one, Matt, so we're going to be different. I'm going to stick with Hot Rod Charlie. I, I've, I've been betting Hot Rod Charlie this year, and I, I'm going to stick with him. I just think he's the best horse in the race. Um, yeah, there, there are reasons to think that maybe he won't have his very best for the Haskell. We'll, we'll see, but I'm sticking with Hot Rod Charlie. I'm going to use him on top in triples. I'm going to go Hot Rod Charlie either wins or I don't win. I've been hot lately. Let's try to get a triple here. Uh, I'm going to do two $5 try part wheels. And I think the two horses he has to beat are Mandaloon, who's still a little bit of a wild card for me. I, I think Mandaloon might be the biggest danger for the win spot to Hot Rod Charlie. Uh, that's not saying much because those are the two favorites, but I, I think Mandaloon could pop up or maybe Man Mandaloon doesn't throw in a huge race and is even out of the money. So Hot Rod Charlie on top, Midnight Bourbon I think is a good bet to be in the top three. So I'm using Mandaloon and Midnight uh, Bourbon in second. Then I'll use three horses in third in the first ticket, which is all the favorites. Mandaloon, Midnight Bourbon, Following C. That's a $5 try part wheel that'll cost you 20 bucks. The other one is exactly the same, a $5 try part wheel. I'm using Hot Rod Charlie above Midnight Bourbon and, and uh, Mandaloon. I'm gonna throw in a long shot though. So I have four horses down below, just in case anti-gravity may be able to pass some tired horses if the speed duel develops. So I have him in third as well on the other ticket. That's a $5 ticket. That'll cost you $30, Matt. There it is. Good luck in the Haskell, folks. It's a fun race. But then we got opening day at Saratoga. We got all these stakes at Saratoga, Matt, coming up. I'm interested in today's Schuylerville. Uh, you got the forbidden, forbidden Apple tomorrow. You got the quick call today. You got a, a, an allowance race that looks like a graded stakes uh, on Saturday with all these lightly raced three-year-olds that look like they could be good. You got a 12 horse field on Saturday in the Sanford, Matt. And I think there's some interesting horses in there. Marilyn Brando is 10 to one on the morning line in the Sanford, Matt. And I like him. Marilyn Brando, I like that name too. But let's focus on the Diana, if we will. And Matt, I think if we're talking Diana, uh, I think we got to start with Althika as the horse to talk about first. Didn't they, didn't they change the name of the race, Brian? They're, they're not calling it the Diana anymore, or am I mistaken? I thought they changed the name to the Chad Brown um, uh, after his uh, boy, uh, I hope five, not. five consecutive wins in the, in the Diana the last five years and a total of six in his career. But yeah, Brian, uh, all, all uh, joking aside, um, uh, the the favorite and and i was it was interesting me to me in the morning line uh uh, uh the the odds are are pretty are, are are pretty even with some of these horses and and some of that is the the betting power of uh of chad brown but uh Athequa was very impressive in my eyes uh, charlie appleby came over uh, sent them over from europe was very impressive uh in her victory in the in the just the game going a mile and to me the additional furlong is is not a negative for alfica yeah i'm, I'm gonna disagree with you there matt um that was a big win for me in the just the game i had alfica and i had summer romance the two charlie appleby horses who were like seven to eight to one that day um i think if you look at alfica's form in europe she is best a little bit shorter uh, so I think the mile at, uh, at Belmont was 
the perfect trip up the rail. Mike Smith got her up the rail that day. And, and uh, I think that was everything falling for her. How, how good she ran that day. She certainly could win the Diana, but at nine furlongs, I don't like her as much. And you got to start looking at some of the other horses in here, Matt, who have great credentials as well. Actually, the morning line favorite is listed as La Mista. La Mista, as you said, trained by Chad Brown. Yeah, uh, La Mista, uh, uh, another, another one that came over from Europe um, into the barn of Chad Brown is a great, is a group three winner in Europe, was second uh, in her American debut in the Bogey. I thought that was a very impressive uh, effort. I was there that day. I like this horse. I think this is Chad Brown's uh, best shot to continue his winning streak in Diana. Yeah, La Mista did look good in her first start in America, which was the Bogey, but Harvey's little Goyle beat her still, and that was her first race of the year. So Harvey's little Goyle is another one that we need to talk about, Matt. Harvey's little Goyle has been a very nice horse on turf or dirt. It looks like they're focusing a little bit more on turf. She comes out of a, a little bit disappointing race uh, where she was fifth behind Mean Mary in the New York uh, over Belmont Stakes weekend, Matt. Uh, I think that slow pace and the yielding turf, though, didn't do her no favors. Mile and eighth, I think, is a great distance for her. I think she's dangerous. Maybe she can repeat what we saw in the bow game. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, I, I looked at it carefully, and, and my, uh, you know, initial reaction was to, uh, you know, to blame that yielding track because uh, Harvey Little, Go Little Goyle, is a very, very big size uh, 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 filly. And sometimes those big horses don't like that uh, uh, soft going. But, you know, on the other hand, Harvey's Little Goyle has run well on, on turf courses that are not firm. But there is a big difference between a track that is uh, labeled yielding and some of the good turf courses that Harvey's Little Goyle uh, has run well on. Uh, um, she'll have to bounce back and get back to her top form to win this race. Yeah, yeah. And and if you look at that New York, Matt, it really wasn't all that bad considering the pace and considering who won the race. And yeah, that was the wettest turf she faced. I agree with you. I, I, I think a firmer turf is better for her. And uh, nine furlongs, I think she'll, she'll be right back to business here. So she's a threat. I and I think, I think the two favorites are going to be Althika and La Mista, leaving Harvey's Little Goyle with some reasonable odds in here. Another one I think will have some reasonable odds in here, Matt, is Summer Romance, because I think people are going to look. She didn't get bet all that much last time in the Just a Game when she ran a good race to be second to Althika. And I think people are going to look at her getting caught at a mile there, and they're going to kind of discount her a little bit too. But I think Summer Romance might, of the two Charlie Appleby fillies, might even be more prone to like the nine for a long she'll be out on the lead again I don't see anybody else who really wants to go head and head with her early so I think she's a big danger as well yeah and I agree with the with the odd situation in here yeah I think that summer romance will get overlooked again and I agree that uh, the betters are going to feel that way getting caught giving up the lead and now going uh, and now going further um, she was a group two winner uh, in Europe. So, uh, you know, we know the quality is there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Matt, we, we've mentioned maybe the top four in the Diana, but I think you can make a point for every single Philly in this race. Yeah, no and question. Yeah, no question about it. A horse like uh, Vigilante's Way for Shug McGahee is going to be a big number in the betting. And, and Shug finally seems to have this horse uh, um, at her best after, you know, uh, her campaign last year uh, wasn't quite to the level. But she's coming off of a grade three win at Monmouth Park um, in the Eaton Town against a big, big full field of 12 so this is this is a horse that's going to come running and we know Suge likes to win at Saratoga big price um one you got to consider uh in your exotics yeah absolutely Matt if she's anywhere near that 20 to 1 Shug's never 20 to 1 but if she's anywhere near that 20 to 1 on the morning line that uh, uh Saratoga's come out with uh it's very interesting but the race before the Eaton Town was really good when she came running out being married down at yeah. Pimlico. So a very interesting long shot there. 
Matt, we've talked about Saratoga opening today, Thursday. We're excited, but also Del Mar. Del Mar is such a beautiful place. Del Mar is the host of the Breeders' Cup in 2021. So this San Diego, which is kind of the opening weekend feature, the grade two mile 16 San Diego, becomes not only a prep, traditional prep for the Pacific Classic next month, but also it is, it is a, a bit of a long-term prep for the Breeders' Cup Classic, Matt. And uh, I think we have an interesting feel. I, I think people are going to jump on, finally going to jump on Royal Ship. Uh, the Brazilian horse uh, has really done well his last two starts. He's been a turf horse more than a dirt horse in his career, but two straight top races with country grammar. Uh, he looks to be the favorite in San Diego. Yeah, in a sense, the San Diego is, is, it's a lot of the same horses, a lot of those older males from uh, uh, the West Coast getting back together again. Uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, there's no country grammar uh, in this race. And to me, that makes uh, Royal Ship uh, uh, a horse that seems to have an edge in consistency in the kind of races uh, that uh, he's been in lately over the rest of this field. Yeah, and we've seen horses from South America really get good uh, after a few races in California. And Royal Ship is starting to maybe fit that bill. If he runs to, to his last two, a nice win in the Californian and then a tough second in the Gold Cup, he deserves to be the favorite and he'll probably win. But on the other hand, we're switching tracks from Santa Anita to Del Mar. We're going from a mile and a quarter of that Gold Cup down to a mile and 16th. So I think those variables make it an interesting race, at least to think that other horses can do better. And I think the two horses we got to talk about most would be Express Train and Rushi, who ran third and fourth in that Gold Cup. Express Train especially has some nice wins at Del Mar, Matt. He's the San Pasqual winner from earlier this year. I thought he was too far back in that mile and a quarter Gold Cup. I think he might really appreciate things in this San Diego. Yeah, and I think uh, at the, the point that you made about that distance change is very significant for a number of horses, uh, a number of horses in that uh, in this field with Express Train being being one of them. Uh, um, the, the move back to a mile and a 16th is going to be really helpful. And, and, and you can't, you know, you can't really fault his past performances. Third in that gold cup, third in the Oakland handicap, second in the big cap. And then as you mentioned that last win in the San Pascal, which was a, a shorter distance. Yeah. Yeah. Express train and you going back a year or more, uh, nice wins at Del Mar. So watch out for Express Train, maybe slightly forgotten of coming off that Gold Cup. Another one who, who probably won't be anywhere near Royal Ship in the odds is Rushy, Matt. And I think Rushy is a horse better suited for a shorter distance than that mile and a quarter he found in the Gold Cup. I expect him to improve. It was his second race of the year. Before that, he gave By My Standards everything he wanted at Oakland Park. By My Standards came back and ran a big race in the Met Mile. I think Rushy, like Express Train, is dangerous in the cutback in distance. Yeah, can't argue with him when you go back and look at that second in the Oak Lawn Mile uh, behind by my standards, who, who is still at the top of his game. Yeah, and, and there are some viable long shots in the San Diego too, Matt. Do you have, uh, you have, a, you have one for us? I do. You know, I, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion of this race, to me, it's a little bit of, of that same old crowd uh, reassembling again um, at a different distance. So I was looking for a little bit of an outsider and, and I, I came across Mo Mosa for Michael Maker, who is having, uh, who's going to have a pretty big presence out at Del Mar from what I understand with a barn of a pretty significant size um, in California. Um, and Mo Mosa was the winner of the Sexton Mile, a grade three at uh, at Lone Star in his last race. And the mile and a 16th is a good distance. So uh, going to be a big price in my eyes. Yeah, Mike Maker's done this before where he's gotten some of these older horses to just kind of turn it around. And uh, maybe, maybe this horse is in the process of doing that. Coming from Nebraska and then a sloppy track at Texas, I'll need to see one more, but uh, yeah, the odds are, are right. Maybe he's worth a pop in here. And the horse I'm going to mention too, Matt, is a horse who's got some back class. His name is Kiss Today Goodbye. 
Uh, last couple of races, he didn't do a heck of a lot in the Pegasus and then uh, going a little bit longer out there in California. But I think he's got some class and we've seen him pop up before. Horse has absolutely no speed, so he'll have to have this race set up for a, a little bit. But I think his to get today goodbye will be dismissed as he was in the San Antonio when he won at odds of 15 to 1 late last year. So another perhaps interesting bomber in the San Diego, Matt. We've talked about Monmouth. We've talked about Saratoga. We've talked about Belmar. What a great uh, uh, weekend of racing, Matt. Let's get down to some brass tacks with the picks. We already gave our suggested wagers for the Haskell, but I want to get our first and second pick in all three of these big races that we focused on. So you start, sir, with the Haskell. And we're going to change up the way we've got our picks on our pick board uh, this week. Uh, we'll still have our top choice, but instead of uh, identifying a horse that is strictly a long shot. We're going to give our second choice. A lot of times that's going to be a horse at a big price, but it gives us a little more, more flexibility with that other horse we want to mention. So please take note of that change horse center, uh, horse center fans. I talked earlier about, you know, uh, my predicament in the uh, Haskell. So I, I'm going to take a shot that Hot Rod Charlie's going to be off his game. I won't be surprised nor upset if Hot Rod Charlie wins this race. Um, my top choice is going to be following C and my second choice, Midnight Bourbon. Yeah, I agree with you on Midnight Bourbon, Matt, especially considering the odds. He'll be my second pick behind Hot Rod Charlie, the big one at Monmouth. In the Diana, I'm going to try to beat those two horses I think are, 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 are going to be the favorites, Alpica and uh, La Mista. So I'm going to go back to Harvey's Little Goyle. I think she can bounce right back, coming back to a shorter distance of firmer turf at Saratoga. And I'm going to think that Summer Romance is going to run another good race on the, uh, on the speed. So she'll be my second pick in the Diana. Yeah, and hey, Harvey's little girl is a horse you got to love. Beautiful, beautiful, big gray. Uh, and again, uh, wouldn't be upset to see her uh, back in the winner's circle. But I'm going to go uh, with uh, Fika. I, I think that she is a classy, classy filly who uh, had a tremendous performance in her American debut. She stayed over here, and, 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 and that's got to be a plus in her carrying her form over. She'll be my top pick. And uh, Chad Brown with La Mista will be my second choice. Okay. Matt, one more race. It's the San Diego. I'll let you go first. It looks like Royal Ship is going to be the favorite. Who, who are your picks out there? I'm going to go with uh, the class of the field, Royal Ship in the San Diego. And my second choice is going to be that Mike Manker runner that I talked about, Mo Mosa. Okay. For me in the San Diego, I really thought about trying to beat Royal Ship in here because I think there are some circumstances with the distance and the track change, but I just can't get off that recent form. It, it just looks like one of those South American horses who's getting very good. And for that reason, I'm going to stick with Royal Ship as my top pick. Uh, Express Train was close, was close, but I'm going to just throw in my long shot here for a second. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with that long shot. Hope Kiss today goodbye could make a big run uh, from well back in the San Diego. All right, Matt, that's the show. It was a big show. Let me get a party chop from you, my friend. Hey, Brian, three great summer meetings at three great summer tracks, Monmouth Park, Saratoga, and Del Mar. Um, I hope you enjoy your uh, uh, racing this weekend. I hope that you can all be at one of those uh, wonderful uh, summer race tracks. I'll be at Monmouth for the Haskell. Uh, get your Haskell hat, say hello. Um, if, I, uh, if I bump into you, and of course, I wanna thank our producer, Tony Bada Bing, for putting together the race. Matt, don't bump into anybody holding a beer out there at Monmouth Park. Uh, that would be a faux pas on your part. Folks, we appreciate you watching every week. I hope you do really well on this big opening weekend of big tracks plus Monmouth's big card. We didn't even talk about some of the other big stakes there, uh, Matt. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation, do that now. Turn on those notifications so you never miss another episode of Horse Center. Thanks to Tony Bing. Thanks to Candace Curtis for the race graphics. Folks, we'll be back right here next week on another big show of Horse Center. We'll see you then.